guys, I, I know you probably checked how long this video is and you're like, what is going on? A lot of things are, are tied to this message we've been kind of hinting at and tracing through and laying the framework for what we're about to do. Stay with me, buckle in, and I think you'll see why we see the, the letter of Galatians as so timely for the kind of conversation we're having today in the American church. So, are you ready? Welcome back to Urgent Word. Today, we're diving into the thick of it. You see, Paul is writing this urgent word to the churches in Galatia as they have been influenced by a toxic teaching by some ethnocentric legalists we call the Judaizers. And as he has given his autobiography of faith, he begins to unfold this story of him encountering and confronting a very significant figure in the early church, none other than Peter, right? Uh, codenamed Cephas. This was Peter, like the Peter, Peter, the guy that Jesus was going to build his church on as early church leader. And Paul is saying, hey, look, this guy struggled with the same stuff and I called him out on it. So let's read Paul's recounting of this controversy with Peter. Now, for some context, scholars will debate whether or not what we're about to read is a description of the Acts 15 Jerusalem Council in which the early church decided what of the Old Testament laws, what of the Old Testament customs would be required for, for non-Jewish Christians, these Gentile Christians to do. Right, so would they have to do all the stuff related to the old covenant with Israel as they were to become proselyte Jews? In other words, that they were to kind of shape their whole culture into the culture of Judaism? Is that what following Jesus meant because Jesus was a Jew and he came out of this promise? Or is the Old Testament law uh, something that was pointing at Jesus, something that revealed God's heart and intent in the culture of ancient Israel, but was no longer something that was required for people to practice in order to follow Jesus. This was a hot debate. And we need to understand that this, this was something they actually needed to talk about together and lean on and discern through the spirit. And so read Acts 15. It's a beautiful, wonderful thing. And ultimately it comes down to very simple laws at the table. There's only four that the, the Jews were inviting their fellow Gentile believers to practice. And it all had to do with keeping unity at the table. They addressed problematic practices with Roman dining culture, but they weren't saying you have to be a Jew to follow Jesus. The council didn't say that. The Holy Spirit didn't say that. They discerned together that they could be Gentiles who followed Christ. They didn't have to convert to becoming a Jew in order to follow Jesus. They could retain and transform their own culture without becoming uh, a part of the, the ethnic spiritual tradition of Judaism through, say, circumcision. So you're going to hear that come up, these ethnocentric legalists that Paul is combating actually persuade Peter, the circumcision group. You're going to hear them come up that, hey, if these guys are going to follow Jesus, they have to become a cultural practicing Jew. They've got to leave their culture behind and become one of us. And Peter starts to believe him. But Paul ain't having any of it. So here we go. When Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in front of them all, You are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? We who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in 
Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. But if in seeking to be justified in Christ, we Jews find ourselves also among the sinners, doesn't that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroyed, then I really would be a lawbreaker. So guys, we need to understand these legal terms, justification, the, ju you know, the law, the works, all of these things are describing the relational status between God and people. If by obeying the old covenant to the, to the you know, cross or T's and dot our I's and we do everything that the old covenant required, does that make us right with Christ? Well, no, it, kind of the point of the whole thing was that this holy people, uh, that people are, are so compromised uh, by sin that, that nobody could live it out. Ancient Israel didn't live it out. Not one of the faith heroes lived it out fully. It all pointed to Christ. And so Paul is, is reminding Peter of this, that, that, that we lean on Christ. And, and if you can imagine yourself as a practicing Jew and you've, you've lived the faithful life to the best of your ability, and it's still not enough because you're still not perfectly living out the heart, mind, and intent of God, because you're broken and, and, and your desires are transformed and warped by sin. If we who have obeyed this thing since birth are born into these customs as part of our ethnic heritage, if we can't even do it, why are you going to make these Gentiles attempt to justify themselves, to add to the good news of Christ by saying, yes, Christ is justified, uh, you, you are justified in Christ, but you also then have to say, let's get circumcised and become part of our ethnic heritage through this symbolic act of committing to the Old Testament uh, law. Paul's like, Peter, remember, Jesus Jesus is the good news. All of this stuff, the law, pointed to him. So the intent of God in giving the Old Testament, this, this code of laws, of conduct, of rituals, all highlighting the beauty of God, the kindness of God, a whole world of, of symbol and practice and, and economics and calendar that was inviting Israel to represent the holiness of God, all it was for was to get people to grasp the holiness of God, to attempt to participate in it, and ultimately to point to Jesus so you'll see this debate unfold in the rest of the letter of Galatians, and you'll see this all across Paul's writing. And it's this huge question mark for the early church. How are we to relate to the old covenant? And specifically, for those not in the ethnic heritage of Israel, do we need to make them part of our ethnic heritage in order to proceed as a follower of Jesus? Since Jesus was a Jew, should we make them Jews as well? Or is following Christ look a little different than that? This is a hot debate. It's what is the crux of the issue in Galatia. It's what Paul is arguing against these false teachers. And he's saying, man, even Peter, even Peter, you know, the rock, he, he was allured by this idea. And so we're invited into the debate. We're invited into reliving this confrontation, whether this happened before, during, or after the Acts 15 Jerusalem Council. Paul is reminding us the direction that we see that council take, which is that Gentiles do not have to become cultural Jews in order to follow Jesus. Let's just paint the scene, guys. Our prejudices, our anxieties can come out at the table. You see it in the lunchroom, right? People kind of go into their clique and the social strata start to become more evident when people have the choice of eating together with people. And you don't want to be caught eating with the wrong crowd. You want to be eating with your crowd. And this was happening to Peter as the Gentile believers were coming into table fellowship to participate in the good news and the new ritual of, of the Lord's Supper, of celebrating what Christ had done, a group, the circumcision party, this ethnocentric legalistic group, similar to our Judaizers, maybe even the same kind of crowd, 
they said, dude, these, these guys haven't yet become fully Jewish, so you shouldn't be eating with them. And Peter, it's that anxiety show. And we could say this is ethnocentrism at the table. This is xenophobia. This is racism. There's a multi-ethnic anxiety, a multicultural anxiety at the table of God. Is this part of the good news that, hey, you really be got to be one of us in order to be present with the Lord? Is that the good news? Paul is ticked about it. And he writes and he confronts and he's ultimately representing the the voice that comes out at the Jerusalem council and Peter would agree and guys I just want I don't want to leave it here uh, we, we've talked about first Peter before uh, we've talked about uh, this this idea that he is writing to all different places uh, scattered throughout the greco-roman world he's writing to these people in Asia Minor by the book of first Peter his letter he's saying dude our heritage is your heritage you're 100 part of this people he's not othering the gentiles and i just want to note that that peter seems to have this change we see it in the acts 10 at cornelius's house we see it out of coming out of the jerusalem council acts 15 and we if we hear it in his writings and so what represents the heart of god what the holy spirit has done through peter through paul has shown us what it looks like to be a multi-ethnic church, a church that invites people not to become more like our cultural group. And if anybody had to claim that their culture was inspired by God and is the best culture, it would have been the Jews. And even this, Paul and the voice of the Holy Spirit through Paul and other New Testament writers are saying, no, even our culture that God kind of give he gave us this culture. He gave us these customs. He gave us this, this covenant identity. He gave us the tradition of circumcision to denote who we are and our commitment to God. As beautiful as it is to have a God-given culture, even obeying the norms of this culture is not is not a justification. It doesn't make us right with God. It might illuminate some of the character of God in the cultural context of its day as God intended, but it also, as God intended, pointed people to their need for Jesus to be justified by him to come to God through the grace of God not through the works of our own hands so yes this works law debate do we earn our way through obedience to salvation in Jesus or do we accept it and experience the freedom of being justified in Christ and respond accordingly that's part of this debate and I don't want to wash that away as we've kind of narrowed in on this ethnic lens of the debate. But I do think it's incredibly significant to this letter and understanding as, a, as, a, as we participate in tech espionage, as we uh, explore the cultural context of these letters and, and, and paint the picture of the situation. This debate is largely one centered on multi-ethnic questions. How do we be a people of God? that's not just Jewish. Can we be a people of God and be multi-ethnic? And this question is answered in so many ways with a resounding yes from the Lord. Yes, we can be and we will be because that is part of the good news to the world, to make disciples of all nations in Revelation, every tribe, every tongue, every nation. So when a, an ethnic group gets it in their head like the jews did and and maybe even most understandably the jews because their culture was crafted from the word of god when a culture gets it in his head an ethnic group gets in his head that to follow jesus is to look more like us there's a problem that paul would confront and so i want to re-situate the situation is that a phrase? Resituate the situation. I want to. I want us to understand the prescience, the timeliness of this text, and the issues facing the Acts 15 Jerusalem Council, and this confrontation that Paul had with Peter, and the situation of the Galatian church. This ethnocentrism. That yes, I'm glad you follow Jesus, but you really got to start looking more like our ethnic group, because that 
means that you're actually a disciple. This is a life today. I want to visit the cutting analysis of uh, theologian Soong Chan Ra. He's a missiologist, a church planner. He's a professor at North Park Seminary. And I, I think his writing and, and his voice is one of the most important at our time in church history. I really do. Hello, Professor Ra. America, this generation, the generation that we're a part of, is, is undergoing a transition. By 2050, uh, there will be a non-white majority in the U.S. and the United States. Right now, we're at a majority of predominantly Anglo-Saxon descent. And by 2050, in some estimates early as 2040, and in some regions, this is already true. And in some cities, this will, will be true even sooner. And rural Appalachia will lag behind. But we're moving towards a non-white majority in America. And this kind of multi-ethnic anxiety, what, what Sung Chan Ra calls a cultural captivity, is alive and well with us today. So let's revisit the Acts 15 situation that we just read. The, whether or not this event that Paul describes is before, after, or, or during the Acts 15 debate, it's along the same contours. Let's read his wonderful analysis and we'll move forward. In Acts 15, the Jewish elders of the Christian church gathered to discuss the Gentile problem. Around this time, Gentile believers were increasing in number within a faith that had largely operated as a subset or sect of Judaism. Quoting another author, the rapid progress of Gentile evangelization in Antioch and further afield presented the more conservative Jewish believers with a problem. Before long, there would be more Gentile Christians than Jewish Christians in the world. The changing demographics of the early church required a rethinking of how the early church was doing church. The church's captivity to Jewish culture had to be reconsidered. The Jerusalem Council, depicted in Acts 15, serves as a pivotal moment in church history. The willingness by the leaders of the early church to release the captivity of the gospel message from Jewish culture freed Paul and others to be begin to take the gospel deeper into non-Jewish culture. This ability to culturally translate the gospel into non-Jewish culture began the process of translating the gospel message that allowed the Christian faith to become a global phenomenon. In other words, the way the Great Commission to, to make disciples of all nations, to go into the world that Jesus set up, that had his disciples do, that we see unfold in the story of Acts, this whole thing is it's, it's, it's hinging on the ability for the gospel to reach each ethnic group, to reach each cultural milieu for it to be understood. Because the good news isn't, hey, you can be, you can become part of our ethnic group. That's not, that's not it. To become a child of Abraham doesn't mean you have to become a cultural Jew. It's, it's part of a bigger promise that's actually a promise meant to bless the whole world, every tribe. And so this is a key issue for understanding even what the gospel is and what church is for. Are you hearing the relevance to this question? I want to go to another important voice. Unfortunately, the late Richard Twist, who passed away some years ago. We miss you, Richard Twist. I want you to, to see that this multi-ethnic anxiety and this cultural captivity that Sung Chan Ra describes has been a huge shaping factor in the American church. And so we must understand that part of the way that we assume missions should go is, is a part of our, our ethnic heritage as, you know, predominantly white American uh, church tradition that we have inadvertently participated in the kind of anxieties of the circumcision group, the kind of anxieties that Peter fell victim to, the kind of anxieties that Paul puts on blast. Let's read here from Richard Twist. Dr. Paul Hybert describes as the white man's burden their perceived need to educate and civilize the world. The missionaries equated Christianity with Western culture and its apparent superiority over other cultural forms and expressions, a presupposition not necessarily based on 
truth, but on the progress of industry, science, and commerce. Quoting Hybert here, he says, The 17th century New England Puritan missionaries largely set the course for modern missions. They defined their task as preaching the gospel so that Native Americans would be converted and receive personal salvation. But early in their missionary experience, these New Englanders concluded that Indian converts could only be Christians if they were civilized. The model by which they measured their converts was English Puritan civilization. The missionaries felt compassion and responsibility for their converts. They gathered these new Christians into churches for nurture and discipline and set up programs to transform Christian Indians into English Puritans. Is that what it means for new Gentile believers, so to speak, to come to the table that they become like us? Guys, this is cultural captivity of the gospel. This is the kind of ethnocentric stuff that Paul is calling out in his letter to the Galatians. Let's continue with Richard Twist as we dive into American history. From the inception of government-sponsored and church-run schools in this land, missionaries made a practice of prepping young native boys and girls by cutting their hair in a uniform style, a custom that continued until the early 1900s. As much as anything, these haircuts symbolized an attempt to civilize Native American young people and turn them into good little Englishmen, Dutchmen, Frenchmen, etc. Bad haircuts were but one example of forced changes and the replacement of traditional clothing, language, and culture. Changes that were a denial of people's God-given identity and existence. If I can be so bold, this kind of approach to missions could legitimately be viewed as a kind of cultural genocide. So guys, let's just put it as it is. The way Paul is describing, if we have changed the gospel, remember he doesn't he doesn't give thanks in this letter. He jumps right into it. I'm I'm astonished that you have perverted the gospel. You've changed it. You've worked it. You twisted it. When we twist the gospel into your discipleship, your maturity in Christ, your relationship with Christ, maybe even your salvation depends on you looking, dressing, acting a certain way. That's not actually what the good news is. I'm not saying that there are no principles that could be derived for dress or behavior or for cultural transformation. I'm not saying that. The good news, following Jesus, will transform you, and it will transform your culture of origin. But your relationship with Christ is not measured by how Jewish you appear, how white and Western you appear. Are you understanding what I'm saying? You don't have to start wearing a suit to church to show that you're following Jesus well. You don't have to start wearing your your hair and makeup and heels and a dress on, on Sunday mornings in order to show that you're taking your faith seriously. Wouldn't you think that's a bit silly? This is the kind of cultural captivity that we can fall victim to that's in the same kind of ethnocentric legalistic thread that Paul's opponents are teaching in. And while we're on it, while we're heated up with Paul, as he confronted someone to his face, I'm going to step into that tradition and throw myself out here and fire some shots. You ready? When I was in high school and I was thinking about going to college, I I briefly entertained the idea of going to Liberty because I thought that would be a good school, right? Christian University, not too far away. It's like the second biggest one in the world. Check this out. I heard about their dress code and I looked it up for this video whenever this is published. And I think it's about the same it was when I looked it up to begin with when I was entertaining it, you know, years ago when I was thinking about going to college at this school. And let's just, let's just dive in. Uh, dress code guideline. Okay. So once you find this PDF here, uh, here we go. Dress code guidelines. Let's look at the philosophy of dress code. Liberty University trains students from all walks of life for many different professions and most importantly for serving as champions of Christ for this reason. Okay. Because of being champions for Christ. For this reason, the university has established a standard of dress for the university community, which is conducive to a Christ-like environment. (laughs) So what follows in terms of dress and cultural normativity, what you should look like is in the name of Christ-likeness. Okay, you ready? Cleanliness, neatness, appropriateness, and modesty are important guiding factors. Students are expected to dress modestly all the time. Sounds fairly reasonable, but we go just a little further down. Dress code for men. Hair and clothing styles related to 
A counterculture, as determined by the Dean's Review Committee, are not acceptable. So countercultural clothes are not acceptable. Well, what if you're not part of the dominant culture? Hair should be cut in such a way that it will not come over the ears, collar, or eyebrows at any time. Ironically, I just got a haircut yesterday, but as you've noticed, my hair often goes over my eyebrows. Is that, is that mean that I'm not like Christ, who probably had long hair? I guess that rolls out Richard, KB, John Foreman, and probably Jesus. Ponytails for men are unacceptable. Okay, what if they're part of your cultural heritage? Does that mean that someone who looks like this, this is Cherokee Christian theologian Randy Woodley, can't be Christ-like in their dress and appearance? How is this not ethnocentric legalism? Leave me a comment. <laughs> I'd love to know what you think. Facial hair should be neatly trimmed. Earrings and or plugs are not permitted on or off campus, nor is body piercing. Okay, so I'm, I'm fired some shots. Here's my case. I think Paul would be ticked. Why? Why do I think Paul would be ticked about this? Because I believe what this is doing here is saying if you really want to follow Jesus and be conducive to a Christ-like environment, you have to look like you play golf on the weekends with your upper middle class suburbanite friends. I don't think that's a way we should be determining someone's Christ-likeness. And I think this is rightfully could be considered Western white cultural captivity, the same stuff that Sung Chan Ra calls out, the same stuff that Richard Twist was concerned about. This is the kind of stuff that would provoke the kind of rhetoric that Paul is leveling. We need to call it out. If following Jesus means that you have to start looking more like a middle upper class suburbanite, if that's what it means to follow Jesus, then guys, we have indeed twisted and warped the gospel. Christ will touch every aspect of your life. You will reconsider dress. You will reconsider your culture. You will reconsider everything about you, your identity, your sexuality, your profession, your interests, your relationships. Every part of your life will indeed be touched by Christ. But that does not mean that you have to look more like me or for the people writing this dress code, more like them, that that's the seal of your faith, of your discipleship. And we in the West have all too often do, done this, made other cultural groups accept language, dress, customs as a part of what it means to be in the good news as you become a little bit more American. May we repent of this. May we see that this indeed is a compromise of the good news. And may we have a more robust and less anxious attempt at living as the early church in a multi-ethnic reality, a multicultural reality, that the dominant culture and the non-dominant culture can hold hands and be changed in Christ-likeness each being invited to transform their culture, but at the same time, becoming more of who they are in Jesus, not less of it. I hope this urgent word has landed home. I hope this conversation would honor the kind of intent that Paul is expressing as part of the good news. You didn't have to become a practicing cultural ethnic Jew in order to follow Jesus. And you don't have to become a white western suburbanite to follow jesus either so may god transform us all into his likeness and may we become more of who we are in him together all right can't wait to pick up this conversation again we'll see you next time let's close with some reflection what extra rules have you encountered that people put on top of the gospel how can you like paul call them out <laughs>